could see. The clouds broke, they broke, and oh, what a break for me. I can see the sun apply, though we're caught in a storm. I can see where you and I could be cozy and warm. Let the rain fit a better, but it really doesn't matter if the skies, skies are gray. Long as I can be with you, it's a lovely day. Long as I can be with you, it's a lovely day long as I can be with you it's a lovely Every time it rains, it rains Pennies from heaven Don't you know each cloud contains Pennies from heaven You'll find your fortunes falling All over the town Be sure that your umbrella Is upside down Trade them for a package of sunshine and flowers. If you want the things you love, you must have showers. So when you hear it thunder, don't run under a tree. There'll be pennies from heaven for you and me. Thank <laughs> you. 
Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the February Medical Leadership Huddle, hosted by the Virginia Hospital Center Foundation. I'm Tony Burchard, President of the Virginia Hospital Center Foundation, and thank you for joining us. It's great to be back with all our key stakeholders to share the latest COVID-19 updates with a specific focus on the Northern Virginia community. As you know, VHC uh, continues to be a le leader in the COVID-19 response because of support and partnership from community members like all of you on this medical huddle. So let's get going. And to ensure the best viewing quality, I ask that all the participants uh, stay muted and, um, and keep your video turned off. And when we get to the Q&A uh, presentation part, um, you can go ahead and send your questions to foundation. Actually, you can send your questions at any time to foundation at Virginia Hospital Center Dot com. So let's get going. Um, joining us today is Dr. David Lee. And for the folks that didn't join us last month, let me give a quick reintroduction. Uh, David Lee joined the hospital's executive leadership team at the end of last year and when he became our chief medical officer. And he comes um, to that role with over 30 years of experience here at Virginia Hospital Center. Uh, he's an Arlington boy. Uh, born and bred, and it, he served as the operating room medical director at uh, Dominion Anesthesia since 2007, he was elected the president of the Virginia Hospital Center medical staff in 2018. He and his wife, Carolyn, are longtime Galen Society members. Thank you very much. And he's a member of the hospital system and foundation boards. So uh, thanks for joining us, Dr. Lee, for another med medical leadership huddle. And at this point, um, over to you, sir. There Hello, hey Tony. Hey, good Dave. to be here this afternoon with everyone. Thank you. So uh, I'm feeling pretty good today. I'm looking out my window. It's nice and sunny. I think uh, the temperature is supposed to hit the uh, mid 50s. So there's some room to be optimistic. I see uh, COVID numbers not only nationally going down, but also going down here in uh, Northern Virginia and Arlington. So there's uh, a lot to be hopeful for. Now, uh, we're on a downward trend. You have to remember, if you look at the incidence curve of this terrible disease, it kind of like a three hump camel. We had a little hump back in the spring with a peak. We had a uh, bigger hump uh, in the summer. And then we had our biggest hump actually in uh, December and early January. So now we're on the downward part. Uh, we went from as high as 250,000 cases diagnosed daily to now uh, less than 70,000 cases daily. So we're on a good curve, uh, you know, not perfect, but we're, we're heading in the right direction for sure. Now, um, I think this trend is gonna continue. And if you follow the news or listen to the experts, it looks like uh, folks are excited about the vaccinations, uh, the fact that uh, folks have already had COVID and probably immune to some extent. Uh, maybe looking into the, the spring and summer months as possibly a time when we could reach, dare I say it, herd immunity, you know, maybe 60, 70, 80% of the population being protected from one way or the another. So how are we doing here at the hospital? Well, this is a good barometer for the local region and the national uh, area. Uh, currently, we're down to a low of about 40 patients in the hospital with COVID. We have a handful of patients who are being ruled out. And those are folks uh, we may suspect COVID. So we've got them isolated. We've tested them. We're awaiting the test results. The testing modalities we have here at the hospital, we have multiple. They're all rapid tests. Uh, we have an rapid rapid test. We can uh, get that back uh, within an hour. We uh, now most of our testing is done on what's the Thermo Fisher platform. So that's also a rapid test that only takes about an hour or two to run. But we like to pull, uh, fill the plate with about 96 samples. So it takes time to uh, fill that plate before we run that test to get the result back. Um, our positivity rate here has dropped to about 3.1% over the last seven days. The previous seven days was 4.5%. 
Uh, we've fallen below 10% since December. So those are all great news. Uh, and even the sickest of the sick are decreasing. We've got currently five patients in the ICU uh, who have COVID. They are all quite ill on the ventilator. So, um, you know, their condition is still murky, but that number is certainly down from where it was before. And if we look at the uh, hospital staff, uh, we're down to about 14 people who are furloughed. So these are people who've either had COVID or exposed to COVID and we have them uh, quarantined so that they don't uh, come back to work and infect others. And really, if you look at what's happened here at the hospital, very few staff have contracted COVID here at the hospital. We think that's uh, probably seven or less where we couldn't attribute that uh, transmission uh, at home or amongst friends and family where the vast majority of people have gotten it. So all in all, all good trends heading in the right direction uh, with warmer weathers and more outdoor activity. I'm hoping for that number to even drop further. Well, Dr. Lee, thank you so much. That is great news. And, um, and I think it just leads uh, to a lot of the other uh, questions that have been asked in the past, at least since the, our last huddle. And that's really about the vaccine rollout and distribution. Um, last time we met, uh, Virginia Hospital Center was in the vaccine business, you might say. Um, situation uh, has changed due to um, supplies that are available. And Arlington County, with the limited supplies, has been leading uh, the local vaccine program um, directly through the health department. But um, with more, uh, more vaccine uh, rolling out um, from the feds to the state and from the state, you know, here locally, um, what do you see coming down the track around vaccines as far as uh, uh, distribution? So currently there's the Pfizer uh, and the Moderna vaccines. Those are the mRNA type vaccines that were developed uh, fairly quickly due to the technology available. Now, the hospital, the state, we don't own any of the vaccine. The federal government purchased the vaccines directly from the manufacturers and they dole out to the states uh, in, in the proportion to the population. So currently Virginia is receiving about 110,000 doses per week. Uh, that translates into about 2,500 doses for Arlington. Now the state has decided that all those allocated will go to the public health system. And if you look at Arlington Public Health with 2,500 doses per week, that's only about 500 vaccinations per day. So it really doesn't, uh, um, you know, it's not a good idea to divide all those vaccines into small centers. Instead, the public health has decided they're gonna undertake the vaccine, do 500 vaccines per day and treat uh, those folks that are able to get treated. Now, we're in the phase 1B asterisk phase. That means uh, folks uh, 65 and over, uh, any persons with chronic diseases, uh, those in special groups such as uh, teachers, uh, first responders, they're the ones who are currently being vaccinated. So the good news is I have it on good authority that the, the vaccine allocation to Virginia will increase to 140,000 doses per week. So that'll mean more uh, allocated to everyone, including Arlington. And the other good news is the FDA on Friday uh, will convene to discuss the new Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which holds a lot of promise. Uh, that's a vaccine that's a single shot, doesn't need uh, you know, deep freezing. So that's a vaccine that can be more readily available, transported and distributed out uh, more widely. So all good things ahead. Okay, that, that was a lot. Let me unpack just a little bit of that, Dr. Lee. I was kind of taking a few notes here. So, <laughs> um, so if you're 65 or older, um, you can go to the um, online state website and get, a, get an appointment. You can go ahead and do that. that if you're 65 and older, or if you uh, fit into one of the categories that the state deems uh, 1A or 1B, is that correct? That is correct. Yep. And, and so, um, don't, and actually, I guess the only outlier is, um, is Fairfax County 
they did not uh, opt into the state uh, system. So I know there, there are Virginia Hospital Center patients that live in Fairfax County. Um, they would need to go to the Fairfax County um, a website, which I understand is uh, actually very good. So um, that, that should be helpful as well. Um, so you, you talked about there being more um, inventory of vaccines. Again, the federal government uh, owns all the vaccines. It, it's then distributed to the state. The state distributes it locally. We're part of the health, Arlington County Health District and, um, and it will play the role that we're asked to play. But, um, you know, when, and you mentioned the J&J &J vaccine. My understanding is there's gonna be a lot of the J&J &J vaccine. As you mentioned, it's a single dose vaccine. Um, at this point, that's how it was tested and that's the emergency use authorization is, is a single dose. Um, as we get more and more uh, inventory um, coming online, do you see um, the corporate pharmacies, the big box stores that have pharmacies, you know, the CVSs, the Walgreens, uh, the, uh, the even Walmarts that have pharmacies, do you see them playing a larger role in, in this vaccine, national vaccine program? Absolutely. I, I think the, the idea is for the federal government to supply Walgreens, CVS, pharmacies to bring it closer to the folks and more convenient. Now, West Virginia, our neighbor, has had great success by sending out the vaccines to the local pharmacies and taking the vaccines to where the people are. And I think that's the plan now. Now, if you look at our state of Virginia, we've given more than 2 million doses of vaccine and more than 1.6 million folks in the state have been vaccinated. So that translates into probably 13 to 15% of the population who have started at least the first dose of the vaccination process. So that's, that's a good start. We need to keep moving forward. We need to make sure that the 140,000 doses coming to the state get delivered very quickly. We need to make sure that uh, more distribution outlets, such as Walgreens, CVS, uh, distribute the vaccine. And perhaps the hospital will get back into the vaccine business if there's enough uh, vaccine to give. Now, we were very successful uh, in December and January delivering over 20,000 doses of the vaccine. So I feel like we have a very efficient mechanism to get that done. Absolutely, yes. and and. Um... We, we got a lot of con a lot of um, contacts, um, or I should say, uh, feedback, uh, Dr. Lee. So you're absolutely right here at the foundation from um, grateful patients who thought the Virginia Hospital Center had provided extremely great uh, service in, in, in providing it uh, over at um, the Walter Reed Community Center here in Arlington. Uh, there's a question about um, the variants, and, and I don't want to get too wonky about the actual names of the variants and where they originate from, that's really less important today. Um, but we do know that um, the natural life cycle of a virus is that it mutates continuously, which is why the common cold, there's really no cure for a common cold because it, it mutates so rapidly that by the time you have a, uh, a cure for the cold, that that variation of the, the cold virus is already mutated away from it. So. Right. You know, so that's not, that's a normal thing. I know a lot of people got nervous when they start speaking of variant, like somehow that was some, that this was some sort of, um, you know, deviation from, from uh, I guess you'd say standard virology, but the reality is that's what they do. So with that in mind, um, these variants that are, that, that, that now have come into our country from other places, um, how does this affect the whole vaccine process? Okay, so let's talk uh, variants. Now, viruses are very tricky. The longer they're out there, the more they're replicating, the more chance that there are going to be mutations and variants. Now, with the COVID virus, I think the variants and mutations are occurring fairly rapidly. Every two weeks to a month, you're getting variants. Now, many of these variants are inconsequential, don't really change much, but occasionally they do really play a role. The British variant is probably the one most familiar to us since it came from Britain. And like all British invasions, it took hold very quickly and uh, it arrived in Northern Virginia. We actually uh, have uh, positive cases in Northern Virginia. But if you look at the numbers, the British variant only is 
1,500 documented cases in the United States. The, the South African variant, 21 documented cases in the United States, and the Brazilian variant, only five documented variants. Now, why do we talk about the variant so much and not, not the variety we already have? Well, these are said to be more contagious, so they have the potential to spread much more quickly and dominate. Now, if you look at the, the vaccines, the original vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna, they're noted to be very effective against the original coronavirus, 95% plus effective. This Johnson & Johnson vaccine, potentially coming out next week, is said to be 66% effective. Now, that's 66% protection against getting the disease at all. Uh, it's very effective, 85, 90, 95% uh, effective in preventing death in the serious form. Now, which is a better, better uh, uh, vaccine? Do you want to wait for the Pfizer or wait for the Johnson & Johnson? Well, it's not a fair fight, right? Pfizer and Moderna were tested very early, so they didn't have to go up against the tougher playoff competition of South Africa and, and England. So perhaps they shine a little brighter in their testing than the Johnson & Johnson, which is being tested right now against all the variants and seemingly less effective in transmitting the disease. But there again, it's not it's apples and oranges and not the same comparison. The, the take home message is whatever vaccine that you have access to uh, the quickest, that's the one you want because that's the one that's gonna give you protection. And the nice thing about the Johnson & Johnson is one dose. So if you vaccinate 10 people, you've protected 10 people. With the other current vaccines, if you vaccinate 10 people, you've only protected half of those people. It's about 50, 60% uh, protection. Very helpful. Um, there was a, a little bit of a, um, uh, uh, I guess you'd say lightning rod uh, published on Friday um, in the Wall Street Journal op-ed piece from a Hopkins doc, uh, uh, Marty uh, McCary, who I know when he was at Fairfax Hospital, he's at Hopkins the last five or seven years. But but uh, Marty, who by the way is not even, um, he's a he's a, a heart doctor, so it's interesting that he got so much play on this. But if you read the piece, Dr. Lee, he, he's saying that um, we should be able to reach herd immunity by April. And his, his argument um, was just do the math. If you take uh, the, how quickly we're, we're vaccinating um, the, the folks here in the United States against the people, the number of people who actually most likely have already had COVID. And, um, and he goes through a very long explanation of why it's undercounted based on the number of tests. Um, he, he, his claim is that we can reach that 80% uh, immunity uh, herd um, target, which would then, which would then allow us to reach herd immunity uh, by April. So, um, you know, that's that's one doctor's uh, thoughts. But here in our local community, what what are your thoughts about how quickly we can reach herd immunity in the community that we live in? Hey, listen, April sounds great. If that comes to the reality, um, I'm all in. Let's do it. But you know. You know, you listen to Dr. Fauci, you listen to CDC, you listen to the preponderance of, of uh, experts. And I think this is gonna linger a little longer. Huh? I'm hopeful that by summer, perhaps by fall, uh, we'll be at herd immunity, but uh, you know, time will tell which model will, will be truthful. Now, in the meantime, vaccine, no vaccine, we know how to mitigate and how to prevent transmission. We've done that here at the hospital. We follow uh, our infectious disease doctor is Dr. Modak. We follow his rules. The M is for mask, the O is for outdoors, the D is for distance, six feet apart or more, A is for avoiding crowds and situations, and K for knowing, uh, being aware of uh, your situation and where you're gonna be at risk. Uh, there's also talk of double masking, there's talk of N95 masks, you know, I think the bottom line is you take all the precautions, you make sure you have a good fitting mask and, and you reduce the transmission by a lot. Uh, with the vaccine, with folks who've already had it, I mean, I'm looking at extrapolating, if you've had 15% of people here vaccinated, 
maybe another, let's say 20, 25, 30% of folks who may have had it. Okay, so maybe right now we're at a 40, 50% uh, protection rate. Uh, we still need to get more. We're not quite sure if you need 65%, 75%, 80%. If you look at a highly contagious disease like measles, you actually need 90% of folks who are vaccinated and who have had prior exposure in order to have herd immunity. So I'm kind of in the middle there. I think perhaps by summer, early fall, I'm hoping that we're gonna get herd immunity. But there again, this could be one of those situations like flu where this comes back around every fall where we herd together again. So maybe uh, this requires like the flu, a booster shot you know, annually to make sure you're protected. And, um, you know, time is gonna tell. This disease has only been with us for about a year, uh, 15 months. So the more data we collect, the more we'll know. Good points, Dr. Lee. So I was gonna ask you about the um, annual booster, but you answered that. But we had a similar question about uh, somebody who was tested COVID positive. Um, what, what is the protocol if you've already had COVID-19 about getting vaccinated? So if you've had COVID, you probably have some level of immunity. The problem for us as physicians is we don't know how much immunity. Does it last a few weeks? Does it last a few months? You know, what variant did you get? Those are inconsistencies, right? So to be sure, even if you've had COVID, when you have access to the vaccine, you should take the vaccine. Uh, and there's some thought that maybe you only need one dose, maybe two dose. These are all conjecture, not proven. Let's go with what we know for sure. If you had COVID or not had COVID, you get the vaccine, you're 95% protected. That's the surety that we know. You mentioned, you know, we've had disease for about 12 months, 15 months. Um, is there any, any, any um, studies that are being published around the effects of, of those that were so seriously ill with COVID, they had to be hospitalized. You know, I know I've heard some people have lost their sense of smell, it never comes back. Um, but uh, is in your readings, Dr. Lee, are you, are you hearing of other long-term effects from COVID? Well, you know what, with, with this disease, if you get a serious form of this disease, it really affects all your organs. So it takes time to recover, you know. Uh, the lung function can be compromised, your heart function can be compromised. A lot of secondary effects can be compromised. So for those with the most serious forms, it could be a long road to recovery. Those with less severe forms, your recovery is probably gonna be quicker. Now there's also the delayed reaction with, uh, with uh, immuno uh, suppression in children that we know can be quite severe after even a month or more of having uh, exposure. So time will tell again, you know, we've had this disease for a year. We'll probably find out more as we go. Once we have the two year studies, the five year studies, the 10 year studies, I think the vast majority of people do make a meaningful recovery but there are subsets of people who may find themselves more debilitated for a longer period of time. And um, do, do you anticipate that, you, you mentioned a booster probably every year um, and the vaccine hasn't been out long enough to really have hard, hard and fast data on it, but, but your, your sense is, we have a question here, is how long do you think the vaccine lasts? Um, um, so where, where are you on that? Do you think it's gonna take an every, every year kind of booster like we would with the flu? Well, so the CDC came out with guidelines that if you're fully vaccinated, they for sure know that you have a three month window or even if you're exposed to COVID again, you don't have to isolate because you're protected. So the data, it just isn't there. We, we, we can try to tell the future, but we don't know the future. But here's the thing. Uh, I was privy to uh, be on a webinar with the NFL several weeks ago around the time of the Super Bowl. And they studied their players very carefully. And no one outdoors playing football in very close proximity got COVID. So as we head into the spring and summer months, when you're outdoors and you're able to, to distance, 
you're probably at very low risk for getting COVID. Now, once fall comes around, the temperatures get colder, we start congregating more indoors, maybe that's an area of concern where transmission is more likely again. So we can only conjecture at this point. Hopefully the more that we uh, uh, battle and eradicate the virus before then, the better it will be for the outcomes and, and future. Dr. Lee, um, we had a question here about therapies um, for COVID. Uh, is there any more of an update you can share with us as far as um, treatments that uh, that that uh, we're providing here and for those hospitalized patients that uh, help um, uh, help their uh, recovery? In many ways, this is a virus uh, similar to having a cold at home. We don't have a lot of good therapy. We've tried uh, monoclonal antibodies. We tried uh, plasma. We tried, uh, you know, high flow oxygen. The hallmark of therapy for this virus and most virus is just good supportive care. So you treat the things you can treat. You treat the fever, you treat the hydration, uh, you treat the nutritional status, you treat the lung function. All those supportive techniques that we know we can do and try to, to ride it out till the body can heal itself, essentially. Because most of the therapies we found are are minimally effective. So good supportive care. I think for most folks, if the viral load is low, we can get you through the, the hard times. You know, we, we can get you, keep you out of the hospital, you know, make sure you're getting all the nutrition, hydration, you know, Tylenol, Advil, those therapies. If you get sick to the point where you come to the hospital, we can put you on high flow oxygen, we can watch it closer, we can prone you, turn you, reposition you, make sure that you're getting care, make sure you're not getting blood clots uh, and secondary infections. That's good supportive secondary care. That's what we offer. That's what helps with the morbidity and mortality, getting you to, to, to home quicker and on the recovery. Last question I've got uh, here, Dr. Lee, that we'll have time for today is, um, is there anything that can be done for patients who um, ha that have a, a high allergic rate to um, to prescriptions? Is there going to be a vaccine that's um, that's developed for them, or is the, the is there is there a better of the three options? Counting J and J, since it'll be available soon, of the three, is is there one that that um, people that have high allergies uh, do better with? So there's ongoing research with allergies and the vaccines, but we already have the answer. As I mentioned, we've given millions of doses of these vaccines, and we have not heard of more than perhaps a handful of serious allergic reactions requiring uh, medical therapy and hospitalizations. So I think even if you are prone uh, to uh, these allergic reactions, I think right now today, I feel pretty comfortable that the vaccines we have on hand, the Moderna, the Pfizer, and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, probably coming on board in a week or so, those are hypoallergenic, right? If you only have five people who have uh, severe allergies out of tens of millions of doses, that's a great track record. That's what I'm banking on. Getting COVID is much, much worse than any reaction that you're gonna get from a vaccine. Sound advice, Dr. Lee. So I wanna thank you. Um, we're out of time today, but um, it's always a pleasure to be with you. We greatly appreciate your expertise and spending time uh, briefing all the folks here um, with um, what's going on within the region. So um, I ask everybody, I wanna thank everybody that participated today, sending in questions and listened in. Thank you as well. I ask everybody to stay safe stay healthy, and we'll see you back next month for our March huddle. Stay well. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.